I want to start by classifying bones by their shapes. We will refer to this as we learn about bones. There's another section in your book that talks about bone markings, the different structures. Actually, I'll go ahead and go to here. Um, so like the head um, and different fossa and facets, those things we will wait till lab to, to learn. Um, and we'll, we'll learn them once in lab generally and then see them applied to the different bones as we learn them. Okay, so first classification by shape. You will see different variations to these, these five classifications, um, but I'm gonna use these five and it's what your book uses. Um, and long bones are the ones you'll see the most often and we'll refer to the most often. These are cylindrical, they are long, they are longer than they are wide compared to wide. It doesn't matter what the length is. So they could be actually like this, short, um, your meta tarsals and um, phalanges of the, the feet and hands are short, long bones. And that's in contrast then to short bones, which are kind of cuboidal and the same distance wide as they are long. So you can have a very short long bone. Long bones are primarily for muscle attachments and they're like levers. Um, so it'll be important for joints and muscle movement. Um, short are fairly uncommon in, in humans. Um, so the wrists, the carpals of the wrists and the tarsals of the ankles provide some stability and support. Okay, then there's flat bones. Flat bones are the sternum um, and bones of the skull as well are, are flat. They are thin and sometimes curved. Um, shoulder blades as well, typically also points of attachment, but also a little more protection. So this important area here. Then we've got irregular bones, basically kind of other, um, not really characterized by anything particular and so complex and diverse. So the vertebrae and some of the facial bones also are um, irregular. Okay, complex, diverse in, in shape and um, structure. Lastly, there are sesamoid bones. Um, this is like a sesame seed and they are forming like basically in tendons. Um, all, all humans only have the patella. So there's some, some other cases that people have, but this is, this is the one example that everyone has shape like sesame seed and it's embedded in tendon. That's what's gonna be unique about it. Um, it actually is protective for tendons. And we'll see it again with, with the knee. Um, I think I didn't say irregular bones also tend to protect internal organs um, or the face, but can be a little bit varied in their, their function as well. So that, those are the different um, shapes. And I'm gonna tell you about the anatomy now, gross anatomy of a long bone. So this is any bone that is longer than it is wide. Um, again, could be a tiny little bone of the finger or, or foot. Okay, so long bone anatomy, quite a bit of it. You'll see it in lab as well. Um, we're gonna use a lot of these terms when we go to talk about bone growth. So this is your first introduction to them. You'll review them and then you'll see them in, in application um, with bone growth, et cetera. So first of all, we've got regions of the bone. So these different regions, we've got um, a epiphysis, which means on top of, 
And this is the proximal epiphysis because it is the end that's near the axial skeleton, near the attachment point. This would be the head. Um, I mean, you can see that, right? This is actually the humerus. This is the one that's close to the body, the proximal epiphysis. Epi means on top of. So this is going to be the distal epiphysis. Um, in between there, we've got a metaphysis. I actually won't use this one as much, I don't think. Same thing down here. And then this long portion here, the bulk of the bone, the long bone, is the diaphysis. So that's basically the shaft. Um, and I don't think I even have metaphysis on your key terms. There's that, those two. Inside the diaphysis, throughout that entire portion, there is a medullary cavity. You'll see it called marrow cavity, some as well, because bone marrow is located inside. Um, so this here is yellow bone marrow. There's also red bone marrow with all this red stuff. Red bone marrow, um, I'll talk a little bit more later. You can see this is no longer in the medullary cavity. Um, in young individuals, there is red marrow in the cavity. In this case, the red marrow is only in this adult long bone. Um, in the epiphyses. These epiphyses is also where spongy bone is located. And you can see this in this picture, spongy bone, and that's in contrast to the compact bone, which is literally more compact. So I'll talk about the difference between those a little bit more later. Then we've got this line right here, so I'm actually gonna clarify, this is an adult. There's a couple differences between this and a child. And one is this one here, this epiphyseal line. It is a line on the epiphyseal end where a growth plate used to be. It used to be the epiphyseal plate. Now it is the line um, which shows that growth is no longer happening. We'll talk more about bone growth. Okay, this is um, just nutrients. We'll I'll talk more about that in just a second. In, in the marrow, actually, I will show that right now. In that medullary cavity, there are a whole lot of blood vessels. So the idea that bones are vascular is really important. So blood vessels, nutrients, this is going to allow bones to heal whereas cartilage cannot because cartilage is avascular. So this is the other component that's located. Vessels. Um, in the medullary cavity. On the ends, we have articular cartilage. What type of cartilage is this? hyaline cartilage, and it's called articular because it's at articulation. And I think the last thing is this inside here versus, where is my little, I have a pointer for it, or the outside. Yeah, right there. Don't love those arrows. I'll go ahead and label them. Periosteum means around the bone tissue. Peri is round, and endosteum means inside. I'm just going to draw this separately. Um, osteum refers to bone tissue. So remember, perichondrium means around the stuff surrounding cartilage. So I'm going to draw here kind of a view of like, what, what, what view is this? A cross section of bone. And distinguish the periosteum from the endosteum. 
the periosteum is going to be right here because it's, it's the outside. So this right here, Let's see, do I want to draw a better picture of that? If we were to zoom into that, we would have the compact bone and then we'd have the periosteum. right out here. This is zoomed in, surrounding the bone tissue. Endosteum is just on the other side. So if we take a chunk from in here, and it's gonna be right along here, we zoom in on that piece, let's have my arrows at least go the same way, it's going to look like, oh, let me, like this. And on the other side there is bone tissue, um, bone matrix, I'm gonna call it, I'm not gonna call it compact bone because it isn't always. All right, okay. So that's the basic anatomy of long bones. We'll see the terms that are most important in use as we go. This is a flat bone. So I want you to use what you just learned about anatomy of a long bone and apply it to a flat bone using four of these terms. That's one you will not use. Um, and I think you should be able to do this. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about compact versus spongy bone. Um, these are the two layers that often exist, um, do exist. <laughs> so in a long bone, spongy bone is more at the ends. Here is spongy. You can see that here as well is actually the bulk of these short bones. So different bone shapes have different proportions of these different bone tissue types. Um, this then is going to be our compact bone. And these two have different functions. Um, compact bone is much stronger. It's gonna provide strength where support is needed the most. And that's what this diagram is supposed to be showing here. So strength, um, this is showing, this would be the femur. Um, or body weight is applied, that weight goes along these compact bone locations to allow for support. So where the muscles attach, that's where this compact bone is, is located and is the, is the thickest. Spongy bone will then is less sturdy. Um, it's going to be, it's open, these spaces, with um, like lattice almost. This is actually called trabiculae. Um, and this can withstand force in many directions instead of just this one direction. So near the joints and then in, in bones where multi movement in multiple directions, force in your hands might occur in many directions. Um, that's beneficial because you then force can be withstood in those various directions. So it's a little bit actually like a comparison between dense irregular connective tissue and dense regular connective tissue, right? With dense irregular being kind of like spongy bone. I think I want to Okay, so I just want to clarify. I know I said this. I wanted to make sure I spelled this right. Trabeculae, I did. Um, and what these are is literally the, the matrix. So this stuff, we take like this. It's not going to be a very good picture. It's the actual lattice network. Um, 
that seems random but makes up this spongy bone and is what is kind of like dense, irregular connective tissue that allows for support in multiple directions and then also allows your bones to be lighter. Um, so your body is a lot lighter, your skeleton, than it would be if um, you didn't have spongy bone, kind of like a bird. Learning check. What three things are in this medullary cavity in reality, but not shown here? So I said I'd talk about bone marrow a bit more. Um, this is a chunk of a femur here. So this would be our compact bone. On the outside, you can see the spongy bone. Um, I'm actually gonna label that separately here. Actually, let's label just this piece right here. And we've got two other types of marrow here. So this is our red marrow. This is where red blood cell, blood cell, not just red blood cells, blood cell production occurs. So actually there are stem cells located in there that divide and allow new blood cells, red blood cells and white blood cells to be produced all the time. This is called hematopoiesis, the making of, of blood. And that's, it's really important. Your body is making new red blood cells because they, they don't live that long, the red blood cells especially. Um, they don't have a nucleus, always making new red blood cells and making new white blood cells to respond to different diseases. Then there is yellow marrow. This is fatty. This is basically a fat storage. Um, and the composition of these different components changes throughout development. So I'm going to show you a picture of that. Here on the left is an infant, less than year one year old. Basically, the long bone is filled with red marrow. Even that medullary um, cavity all throughout the diaphysis, as childhood and then adolescent um, period comes about, the yellow marrow starts to take over that. Um, so it starts to take over both at the epiphyses and at the diaphysis. That continues to extend until in adulthood, there's only red bone marrow at the oops, epiphyses. And that's what I showed you that previous picture already. So this is what it looks like in an adult. Um, I'm going to erase some of this. So red marrow in adult is located in limited locations. This is basically right there. Um, true at, at up here as well. And there is more of it located in some of those flat and irregular bones in the axial skeleton. So because adults still do need to be able to make new blood cells throughout development. All right, so that's it for gross anatomy. Um, we will dive into the tissues and cells next.